It's the RISC-V instruction set manual. I think I'll just peruse this like you do. Uh, let's see. Uh, I haven't looked at load and store instructions in a while. Oh boy. I think I've made some horrible mistakes. I'm, I'm building, building a RISC-V processor, not on an FPGA. FPGA. Now, what does little endian and big endian mean? Well, suppose that I had a value, a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4. It's a 32-bit value. Now, let's suppose I were to take this value and write it into memory. Now, memory is byte-oriented, so we have a word. And little endian means that we're going to take the least significant byte and put it first. So, in other words, the little end comes first. So this is what it's laid out in memory as. So that's little endian. And big endian would be the opposite, where we're taking the most significant byte and putting it first. So the big end comes first, 03 and 04. Now, this is the layout in memory. What about the layout in a register? So let's suppose that we were to load in a little endian machine this value into a register. Well, what is the layout of this in memory? Well, it is actually going to be 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04. And first of all, it's extremely convenient because when you start doing shifts and you know uh, logical operations and arithmetic operations, it's very convenient to have this as a unified 32-bit value. Uh, if we were to take this and, of course, store it in a register, we would just get the same thing. And if we were to take the register contents and store it into memory, you can see that when we store it into a little endian memory, uh, we have to shift around the bytes a bit, um, while with big endian you wouldn't actually have to. So we know that if we take this little endian value, which is just, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, and stick it in a register and shift it by, say, 24, we expect the result to be 0, 1. Uh, that should be pretty obvious because we're simply taking this value, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, and shifting it by 24, so we get the most significant byte. But what happens if we reinterpret this memory as an array of bytes? and we get byte 0. Well, then we would expect the answer to be 4. So the interesting thing is, uh, there's a bunch of ways that we can do this. We can either simply, uh, let's suppose we have a union, for example, and we'll just call it thing, and in thing we have a uint32, and we're just going to call it i, and we also have the bytes, and we're going to say it's an array of like that. So that way, if I say that this is a thing, then of course i is going to be the 32-bit value stored in the memory, which is just going to be ox1234. However, in terms of bytes, this is going to be an array of 4, 3, 2, and 1. So, in fact, by getting b sub 0, we're going to get 4. And, of course, if it were a big endian machine, this would be the opposite, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and 0, 4. Again, the difference is that when you interpret a byte array as a 32-bit value, then the endianness is taken care of for you. So that's why when you get i, it's not going to just be 0, 4, 0, 3, 0, 2, 0, 1. It's going to actually be the 32-bit value that you expect based on the memory layout. So now the question is, what happens if we look at a register like A0 in RISC? And let's suppose that we slap this on top of A0. Well, then things are a little bit different because the compiler knows that registers aren't laid out as if they were laid out in memory. That just doesn't happen. So let's take a look at godbolt.org and prove that. So here we are on godbolt.org, and I've set things up so that we are compiling using the RISC 
532 compiler from Clang or CLang or however you want to talk about it. And I've set it up so that it's optimized, so that the output is optimized. So what I've done is I've written uh, one function called foo, which takes a 32-bit value and then simply shifts it by 24, and we expect to get the most significant byte out of that. And I've written another function called bar, which also takes a 32-bit value, sticks it in uh, this union, and uh, reinterprets it as bytes. And we're simply taking the first byte out of that array. And what we expect is that if this is a little endian machine, we expect the least significant byte to come out of bar. Uh, and now we're going to call it with 0102.03.04, both fun functions. And if we look at the assembly language output, we can see that when we call foo, the result, of course, is 1, because that's the most significant byte. And when we call bar, the result is 4, which is the least significant byte. And if we look at the generated assembly language for the functions, we can see that all we're doing is we're shifting right a0, which is the uh, input value, by 24 and putting that in the output value. And for the reinterpretation function, what we're doing is we're taking the register and we are anding it with FF. So in other words, again, we are taking the least significant um, value, which is 4. So we can see that the compiler knows that, uh, or it seems to know, that the layout in the register is you know, just from most significant bit to least significant bit. Now, that does not have to be the case. Um, when you build the machine, you could, if you wanted to, um, have the registers uh, also be little endian. But then, when you do ands, you would actually have to um, reinterpret your little endian data as big endian and then do the logical or arithmetic operation, which is kind of a pain. So, of course, uh, we're not, nobody's going to do that. Um, we're just going to take the register as most significant bit first. In other words, registers are big endian and memory is little endian. Okay, so what's the horrible mistake that I've made? Well, uh, if we take a look at, a, uh, at an instruction that we expect our ALU to be able to handle, and I'll simply copy the instruction that we saw for shifting right. Okay, so basically we expect this to be source register 1 and this is going to be source register 2. In other words, these are the two operands. And this is the destination register. Okay, So we have our ALU, which is typically represented as this funny shape. Right? And the function is going to be shift right logical. And uh, here is source register 1. So it's going to come from A0. And this is the SR1 bus. Here is the SR2 bus. And we're going to put uh, the literal 24 from the instruction into that. And the output is going to be placed on the destination uh, register bus. And we're going to write that to A0. So we're going to set up all the inputs. And then we are just going to... Uh, you know, let the combinatorial logic happen, and then we are going to clock whatever value is in the destination register bus into the destination register. And that's how we do it. Uh, likewise, if we look at something like and i a0 comma a0 comma 255, well, now that's no longer interesting because now we're just replacing this with two, with uh, and i, and we're just replacing this with 255, and the same thing actually happens. Um, here's a, um, an add i a0 comma 0, z, z or, 0 comma 1, and of course we know that that is actually going to be x0. So again, not as interesting. We're simply replacing this with x0, replacing this with 1, and this is add i, 
and this again is a zero. So, so far there's nothing new. You know, this is what our ALU circuit does and we've designed it to do that pretty well. So, let's take a look at a different instruction. Store word, register A0 into minus 12, S0. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, it means that we're supposed to take the S0 register, or the contents of it, and then we add negative 12. So let's do this, and let's do this. And um, we take a 0, and this is the address, and here's our memory, and here is our data. So all we're doing here is we're taking S0 is some pointer to memory somewhere. We're subtracting 12 effectively. That's the address in memory. And we're going to store that here. Um, here's another instruction. Uh, LW, that's load word, um, S0, comma, 8, SP. Okay. Um, now, of course, SP is an alias for some other register. Um, so is S0 and A0, of course. They're all X registers somewhere. Um, but what this basically does is, as you would expect, it takes uh, the SP as a pointer to memory somewhere, and we're going to add 8, and we're going to treat that as the address into memory. And we are loading, so the data gets stored in S0. So far, so good. Uh, there is just a bit of a problem, though. So let's suppose uh, we treat this as source register 1. And in fact, it is because the layout of uh, the store word and the load word registers um, do use this as source register 1. And of course, this is a destination because we're storing. Uh, whoops, I got that backwards. This is a destination because we're storing. This is a source because we're, uh, okay. <laughs> this is a destination because we're, we are loading into the destination and this is a source because we are uh, storing the source into the memory, okay? So store word and load, load word um, each have uh, format, load word has register one and destination register, and store word has uh, one source and a second source. Okay, well, if we were to map that onto our buses, then this is source register one. And, well, this is something. We don't know what it is. This is source register two. Um, well, okay, where does this come from? And what is this? And let's take a look at load word. Well, we know that this should go on uh, the source register one bus. And again, we don't know what this is. Uh, this is actually the destination register bus. So what is this and what is this? Well, for here, what we could do maybe is say that we're, we're using the ALU for this uh, addition operation, which would force this to be source register 2, but then that would force this to be the destination register, which doesn't make any sense because the destination register is the output from memory. So that's not going to work. The same thing over here, uh, you know, the negative 12 could be on source register 2, but unfortunately we're already on source register 2. So it's almost like we need an extra bus and, you know, I'm just going to call this, you know, bus zero and maybe this is bus zero. And then of course we're going to need a second bus over here. So all of a sudden, you know, instead of having source register zero, uh, I'm sorry, source register one, source register two, and destination register buses, now all of a sudden we're adding two extra buses. And I don't really want to do that. Um, first of all, nothing needs to use these buses except for accesses to memory. And second of all, that would be an additional 64 bits, uh, which I just cannot fit on the interface that I'm using. So, 
it seems like we're going to need in our memory card uh, these internal buses. So, you know, here's our memory card, memory card. So, you know, here's our memory chips and we have the address going in here and we're actually going to need an adder. So uh, the only function that this thing performs is addition, right? So we will have SR1 and then of course the question is well how do we get this thing in here? Well this is the offset and we're going to have to figure that out at some point. Uh, where does this offset come from? Because again it can't be on any of the uh, SR1, SR2, or RD buses. Um, and the data of course um, well we're going to have to switch it you know between the destination register bus and source register 2 bus um, depending on whether we're doing a store or a load operation so of course we're probably going to have to have an operation bit somewhere in here to tell us whether we're reading or writing so that's what the memory card looks like but there's an additional complication and it's really bad so the problem is that it's 32-bit user data, but it's a byte-oriented address. Now originally, and this is my horrible mistake, I thought that address 0 would be some 32-bit value address 1 would be another 32-bit value, and address 2 would be another 32-bit value. In other words, the memory was 32 bits wide because, well, I thought that we've got 32-bit data words. But it turns out that that's not correct because the key phrase is it's a byte-oriented address, which means that address 0 consists of 4 bytes. So far, so good. But the next address is 4. Because this is address 0, address 1, address 2, and address 3. This is address 4, 5, 6, and 7, and so on. Address 8, and so on. So this is a bit of a problem because now we also have the concept of unaligned memory access. And what this simply means is that once you've got a byte-oriented address and you want to load 32 bits, are you stuck with just loading from address 0 and address 4 and address 8? Well, what happens if you load from address 1? Well, you've got two things, either allow it or disallow it. If you disallow unaligned memory accesses, then accessing a 32-bit value starting at a non-32-bit aligned address, in other words, address 1, 2, or 3, or 5, 6, or 7, that will actually cause an exception in the processor. And that basically means the processor is going to halt because, well, you know, the processor doesn't know how to deal with unaligned memory accesses. So the same thing if you try to access address 2 or 3, those are all 32-bit unaligned. Now, when you allow unaligned memory accesses, there are two ways of doing it. You can either do it in software or you can do it in hardware. Now, in software, what that basically means is that any unaligned memory access will cause an exception, but there is an exception handler to basically load the aligned address, 32 bits, throw away the part that you don't need, load the next address, throw away the part that you don't need, and combine them, all done in a software routine. Now, the interesting thing about that um, is that it has certain uh, consequences in terms of atomicity, um, whether you can atomically access an address or not. Because, you know, let's suppose you are in that exception routine and you've just read the first address, but you haven't read the second address, and then an interrupt happens. 
Well, that interrupt could actually modify this address, and then when the interrupt is complete, you go back to your exception handler, and now all of a sudden you're reading different data. In other words, you've failed to atomically read your unaligned memory access. And in fact, uh, you know, in the RISC-V specification, uh, it, it says that unaligned memory accesses are not guaranteed to be atomic. In other words, it's basically up to the machine, how it's built. So the other way of doing this is in hardware. Oh, and I should also say that one of the cons of doing this in software is that, well, first of all, you've got an exception, so you need to store state. Second of all, you've got several software instructions that you need to execute, and then you need to restore state. So that all takes a lot of time. So unaligned memory accesses are almost by definition slower. Well, we want to do things a little bit different. We can do this in hardware. Now, in hardware, what that basically means is um, you would detect that you're doing an unaligned memory um, access, and then you would uh, access the bytes that you actually need and then combine them in the way you need them. And it doesn't take any delay whatsoever. And here's how we're going to do that. So here we have our memory. So again, I'm going to say address zero, and there are four bytes here. And let's have address four. And there are four bytes here. So here's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now let's suppose we were to do a load word instruction. Um, we're going to load um, load it into A0, say, or here, let's say X1, just for the sake of argument. And we're going to, let's see, the offset is going to be 1 from X0. So in other words, X0 is always 0, so we're going to load a 32-bit word from address 1, and we're going to store it in X1. So if this were the actual contents, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and 0, 4, then we would expect x1 to get, and remember this is a little endian machine, so we would expect 0, 4, 0, 3, 0, 2, 0, 1 to get loaded into x1. Again, because this is a little endian machine, 0, 1 is the least significant byte. So what do we want to put on the destination register, right? This is going to be the destination register. So if this is the destination register, RD, from bit 31 to bit 0, and we're going to divide it into the four bytes that we want, well, we want, uh, let's see, 1 to go into here, 2 to go into here, 3 to go into here, and 4 to go into here. So the way we're going to do that is like this. We're going to have source register 1 going into our dedicated adder, and this is the offset. That's what this number over here is. Uh, so load word and store word both take a source register and an offset. And what we're also going to do, we're going to treat this as address. And we're also going to take the address and add 4. And we're going to call this next. So now we have address 1. And if we add 4, we have address 5. Uh, however, what we're going to do is we are also going to take the address only from 31 down to 2. In other words, we're going to skip the bottom two bits. OK, so now, in other words, uh, we can say, zero out um, the bottom two bits. So this would be zero, 
and then next would be 4, right? Because we've got 0 plus 4. So if we were accessing, uh, if SR1 were, say, 0 and the offset were 0, then this would simply be 0 and 4. If SR1, um, let, let's just ignore the offset. If SR1 were 1, then, of course, uh, zeroing out the bottom two bits makes this address, again, 0, and this is 4. Same thing with 2 and 3, but then when SR1 is 4, then this address would be 4, and the next address would be 8. So really what this is, are, what, what address and next are, uh, are 32-bit aligned addresses. Okay, So these are the 32-bit aligned addresses addresses. And of course what we could do is we can simply you know take the lower two bits and you know that would be kind of an offset from the the aligned address. So in other words uh, in this example load word uh, from address 1 uh, this address over here would be 0, this address over here would be 4, and the offset would be 1. Now, the advantage of doing it this way is that if we lay out in hardware our memory in terms of separate 8-bit chips, in other words, 1-byte chips, uh, then what we could do is we could have the address go into here. And again, these are 32-bit aligned address addresses. And this one's address is next. So um, again, this isn't actually 0 and 4. This is, you know, because these are, what, 20, no, 30-bit uh, addresses, right? 30-bit addresses. In terms of 30-bit address space, address would be 0 and next would be 1. So, you know, I guess we could have this adder be a 30-bit uh, adder and change this to 1. You know, that's another way of doing it. So, in other words, this address will be 0, 0, 0, and 1. Okay? And then the data, so uh, let's see. The data is just going to be like this. So this is going to go here, this is going to go here, this is going to go here, and this is going to go here. Okay. Now that's, that's an example of the unaligned uh, address access. Now what happens if this were an aligned access? Well, um, in that case, uh, the offset here would be 0. Um, this would be 0, and this would be 1 again, except that in this case, we would want our chips to have the address over here, address and address. So this would be 0, 0, 0, 0, and then to load that onto our destination bus, we would simply copy the bytes like this. So what we need is a way of telling what addresses to put into the memory chips and how to shuffle around the bytes. And that pattern is based on strictly the offset, right? This is offset 0, this is offset 1, and offsets 2 and 3 would have, uh, you know, comparable things, where offset 2 would have this be next, and then, well, the shuffling is going to be completely different. Let's see, what it, let's see what it actually is. So let's say this is offset 2, and this is next, right? So, um, you know, in, in terms of bytes, this is memory address 2, this is memory address 3, this is memory address 4, and this is memory address 5. So in that case, we want to put, um, again, this is little ending, right? So we want to put this here, right? This here, the next one is here, and the next one is here. So that's offset 2, so that's what that pattern looks like. And then for offset 3, 
this is going to be next. So this is address six. And then the pattern is going to look like this. Again, this is a little endian. So three goes down here, four, five, and six. So you can see that uh, based on the, the four different offsets, we have four different patterns in terms of the addresses that we give to the memory chips and the shuffling that we do in the uh, bytes. So that's basically it. So to summarize, we have SR1 going into a dedicated adder, which will add the offset, which can be both positive and negative. We have an offset, one to zero. We have an address, which is now a 30-bit address. So I'm just gonna say 31 to two with the understanding that this is a 30-bit address. And we will add one and call that next. So what we need is an adder and basically an incrementer because this actually doesn't do anything. So instead of making this a, an adder, I'm just gonna call it increment. So we need an adder circuit and an increment circuit. We also need some sort of a shuffler. So, um, so what are we going to have? We're going to have these four things and we're going to need some sort of a multiplexer to multiplex the addresses, right? So we have address here and next here and depending on the offset we'll switch between one or the other so these are the memory addresses now here's the data 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 and here is um, rd and we're going to need some sort of a shuffler circuit um, so i'm just going to call it you know shuffler at this point shuffler and of course you feed it the offset okay so that's load um, uh, so that's uh, store um, now in terms of uh, no that's load now in terms of store um, in terms of store you get the data to put into the uh, memory from RS2 so it's going to be something like this, actually. So here's the memory data, here's the memory address, and here is the memory. So that's basically what our memory circuit is going to look like. Uh, so in summary, it's uh, a little more complicated than I thought it would be, um, because again, uh, it's not 32-bit word addresses. The addresses are byte-oriented. Byte-oriented addresses. So that was my big mistake. Uh, it makes the memory circuit a lot more complicated, but we decided to do unaligned memory accesses in hardware, which is nice because it means that we can accomplish unaligned memory accesses in a single cycle, which is nice to preserve atomicity. So I can actually make the strong statement that my memory accesses are atomic regardless of whether they're aligned or unaligned, which is great. I think it's great, don't you? All right, um, let's see. What else do we have to talk about? Well, uh, this addition uh, is not a generic ALU. All it does is add. Now, if you will recall our ALU, we used four bit slices. So we had you know X and we had Y and they were four bits wide. The output was four, there was a carry in, and we also had propagate and generate. And 
Again, you might want to review that video where I talk about the ALU, propagate, generate, carry in. And on the top, we had a carry look ahead unit, carry look ahead unit, where all the propagates and generates fed into, and we were able to create all the carry ins for each of the bit slices. Now, how many bit slices are there? Well, there are eight of them. So this is bit slice zero, this is bit slice one, bit slice two, bit slice three, and so on. And of course, uh, this is for addition and subtraction. Uh, we were also able to, to, based on the function, do other things such as you know, bitwise operations, uh, comparisons, that sort of thing. Uh, but this is, this is your basic adder. There was also a function that went into here, and I think it was... I don't remember how, how many functions there were. Functions? I think there might have been like three bits of function or something. So in other words, this isn't 256 anymore. This isn't 16 bits anymore. Here's the function. So again, this is for a generic ALU, which can perform multiple functions. Yeah, and there were three bits here, I think, or possibly four, because I think there was like a, oh yeah, there was a, there was a, a shift thing going on here. So I think this was also four. I may be wrong, but in any case, so how many bits is this? This is 12 bits, 12 bits in by, well, actually, sorry, it's 13 bits, isn't it? 13 bits in by four, five, six bits out. And this, well, again, there's a carry in. So we have uh, eight and eight is 16, plus four is 20, plus one is 21 bits by 10. So 13 bits, right? 2 to the 13 is um, 8k by 6, which is, you know, reasonable. Um, but 21 bits is, uh, I think, 2 megs by 16, which is probably not that reasonable. Um, you have to multiply that by 4, so we would have 4 of these chips, um, as opposed to eight of those chips. So I believe that we settled on this simple 8K by eight uh, chip rather than a two meg by 16 chip. Now, that is for the generic ALU. We don't need a generic ALU. I wish I could like erase whole sections, but apparently I can't. Now this adder doesn't have to have this function because all it needs to do is add, which means that we can have eight inputs and a carry input, and basically that is 17 bits, which is reasonable. Um, it is, if I'm doing my math very quickly, 128K, and this is eight, and propagate and generate, so by 16. Uh, that's, I think, kind of more reasonable. So it's nice because, uh, you know, now I only need four of these. And then, of course, there's a carry look ahead unit up above. Um, so there's two, there's three, there's four. The carry look aheads generate the carries for these dudes. Um, propagate and generate go up here. Uh, we don't need propagate and generate from here. And we don't need to carry out on any of these because, of course, um, risk 5 doesn't use carryouts. So basically, this is 2, this is 2, and this is 2, 2, 2, 2, and we need 1, 1, 1 out. So this is how many bits? Uh, 6 bits by 3. So, you know, basically, this is a 64 by, you know, 4 memory. It's really simple. Uh, okay, so that is what this adder looks like. Now the incrementer is even simpler.
because we don't need the second operand because the operand is always going to be one. So we could, in theory, just do this. We can have 16 bits in, don't need a carry in bit. And uh, let's see, we do need, I guess the carry, actually we don't need a carry look ahead unit, I don't think, because we can feed the carry out directly into the carry in of this. Uh, so this is 16 bits in, 16 bits in by, and of course we have 16 out, so by 17, and this would be 16 bits by 16. So that's a little unfortunate because, you know, uh, we would have to go to the next step up, which would be another 16, but uh, maybe we could finesse it by um, having the first chip just be 16, 16, um, and the second chip just be 16, and all it does is it generates the carry. So this would be a 64K by 16 chip. This would be a 64K by one chip. Um, and this would be, well, there's an input here. There's 16 here, there's 16 out. So this would be a 128K by 16 chip. So that's what the incrementer is. Okay, so there is the adder unit and there is the incrementer unit. Okay, so um, that's how you would implement the adder and the incrementer. Then of course there's the multiplexer that we need to talk about. Uh, let's, uh, let's see, what would a multiplexer look like? What would a 16-bit multi, uh, a 32-bit multiplexer look like? Well, it certainly wouldn't look like a single chip because they don't really make those. Uh, or if they do, they're probably in a BGA package, and I don't really do BGA, although it's something I should look into. So what we want to do is have a one-bit input, and you know we'll just call this I don't know A, and we'll call this B. These are all 32 bits and we have 32 bits going in. So typically what you know I like to do is implement them using buffers and we can certainly do that like this. So there's A and there's B. These are tri-state buffers and these are just connected together and that's your multiplexer. So this is a 32-bit tri-state buffer and of course, uh, only one buffer is active at a time. And if they are both active at the same time, then it is so brief that it doesn't really matter that much. And this goes into memory. So now, of course, we have four of these multiplexers, one for each memory chip. Memory, memory. Uh, so basically we need some kind of a unit that takes in our two-bit offset and outputs four bits, one for each of the multiplexers. And this is probably going to be a simple combinatorial chip. Um, so, well, let's take a look at what it's going to be, right? Let's just call this, um, you know, M0, M1, M2, and M3, and this is, you know, offset. Um, I don't know, we'll call it F, F1, F0. So that's your offset. So it could be 0, 1, 2, or 3. So here's F, here's M0, M1, M2, and M3. And let's see what these are supposed to be, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, and we'll say that, uh, you know, these are going to be 0 equals that address thing, the aligned address, and 1 equals the next aligned address. Okay, so if the offset is zero, then of course we want that. Uh, if the offset is one, then we want this. If the offset is two, then we want this. And if the offset is three, then we want that. Which is interesting because, well, we've just realized that we don't need a multiplexer for the very last uh, memory thing. So we can change this to three. And we can remove that and remove that final column. Okay, so um, basically this is our lookup table. 
and uh, let's just have some fun. Uh, let's change this to F1, F0. So this is 0, 0. This is 0, 1. This is 1, 0, and 1, 1. Well, this is obviously uh, F1 or F0. Uh, this is obviously just F1, and this is F1 and F0. So that's, that's pretty simple. You know, it's one gate, no gates, and one gate. So that's pretty neat. So that's how our multiplexer. Now, what about our shuffler? Oh boy. The shuffler is going to be a lot more complex. So here is uh, our memory layout, mem, 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 mem. And of course, one of the shufflings for offset zero is simply straight through. Uh, another shuffling, uh, so this is offset zero, this is offset one. Here, let's just do this. There's our memory, and there's our result. Um, and for offset one, basically, uh, let's see, this is the least significant. So it goes like this, and then like this, and then like this, and then like this. Okay, so first of all, the question is, uh, how are we going to do that? Because it kind of sort of looks like um, we will need, again, a multiplexer. And this time it's an 8-bit multiplexer, and we have four inputs, one from each memory chip. So that means that we have to select one of four, and the output would be eight. So what does that look like? Well, you know, again, we can just, you know, make it look like tri-state buffers, like this. One, two, three, four, and these all just go together, and these are basically the decodes of a two to four decoder. And we need four of those. So that's what a shuffling unit would be. Um, and of course this offset isn't, um, so this would be, actually no, that's not quite correct. This, this would be a lookup table. Because again, uh, you know, we, depending on the offset, we need to change these uh, buffers to uh, shuffle the, the bytes around properly. So anyway, uh, that is how we would do that. Um, I'm not going to go through the exercise of calculating the lookup tables um, and determining, you know, which multiplexers we don't need. I suspect that we're going to need them all. Um, this is times four. These are all 8-bit tri-state buffers, so, uh, and there are four of them per, uh, per byte. So we would need 16 of them, uh, which is a little unfortunate. That's, you know, a lot of chips, but I think this memory circuit is going to just require a lot of chips, and that's all there is to it. So, and then the question is, well, there's reading versus writing, um, which I haven't fully thought out yet. Um, because again, we need to apply this shuffling except in the reverse direction. Um, so it would be sort of like this. So these would actually be bidirectional buffers. And, you know, this would be for reading and, you know, the opposite would be for writing. Well, the opposite. I mean that if this one is active for reading, then this one is active for writing. So um, that's how basically that would work. So, you know, so now basically all that's left is to actually do the work of, you know, selecting the chips and, you know, deciding what the signals should be. Um, and then there's also that uh, unfortunate consequence of the offset not being able to fit on any bus. And now we sort of need to put that on the bus. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is that there's not only LW, but there's also a, a load half word, and there's also load byte. Uh, and what that does is, you know, if this is memory, and let's suppose we're loading an unaligned address, uh, well, what load word does is it takes this, 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 and then of course the next address, and it combines them. Uh, what load half word does is it only takes two of these, and what load byte does is it only takes one of these. So we're also going to have to have uh, some adjustments to this circuit, um, or will we? Uh, because 
uh, even with load byte, even if we load all four and shuffle things around, well, the byte that we want is always going to be down here. And the half word that we want is always going to be down here. So again, because we're doing this in one cycle, we don't really care about the fact that we're reading these two memory addresses and then not doing anything with it. So what load half word would do, uh, there's also a load half word unsigned and a load byte unsigned. And what load half word does is it sign extends and load byte. What this does is it zero extends. So we could add some circuitry here to either zero extend or sign extend. So in other words, uh, you know, if we were doing a, a load half word unsigned, then we would just fill these with zeros. If we were doing a load high with sign extend, then these would be either zeros or all ones, depending on the high bit over here. Um, so you know, we could sort of have an adjustment circuit maybe over here. I don't know. Oops. I don't know. I'm just guessing. So, you know, we need to know whether it's signed or or zero extended or, you know, or nothing, you know, if, if we're just loading a word. Um, we need to know whether it's a word or a half word or a byte. Uh, we need to know the offset, which I believe is 12 bits, I'm not sure, but it's it's signed. So there's a lot of things that we have to think about. Um, the other thing is that in our register card, we had uh, these, um, you know, uh, what was it? Low, low, something, load, hi, low, high, high, low, and high, high, so that we could, you know, decide to um, decide to access any bytes we wanted. Well, in fact, I don't think we're actually going to need these because load word, load high, and load byte, the results are always 32 bits because, again, these are sign extended and zero extended. So I'm not sure that we need those four signals. So we could save those four signals and use them for this. And I know we've got a bunch of no connects um, left over. So we might just be able to stuff this in. So we'll see. Anyway, I think that's probably about it for this video. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're kind of getting a sense of how difficult this whole thing is. And sometimes I'm just sort of like throwing my hands in the air and saying, this is way too complicated. Why did I even start this? So, um, yeah, it's a big, complicated project. Uh, so... Maybe that's why that I haven't been putting out a lot of videos recently uh, because it's just so overwhelming. But, you know, as you can see, it's not so much overwhelming as just large. The individual issues themselves aren't so bad. It's just that the work after planning is uh, just a lot of work. Not complex, but just a lot. Uh, I think in the next video... Um, for the Elmarv series, I'm going to talk about the tester, which is a little testing card which I can put into the back plane and inject and read signals on the bus to make sure that all the other cards work. And I'll talk about the design of that. I know I've already talked about it a little bit on one of the live streams, but I don't think I, you know, really completed any thoughts. Um, and now I think I have completed the whole idea. And again, it's just a question of actually putting it together in an actual printed circuit board. So I guess until then, I'm building a RISC-V processor, not on an FPGA. FPGA.